this is Tom Parrish and I'm here with Warren Eagles in Brisbane, Australia. Hello Warren, are you all set there? I am Tom, I am in, in Brisbane, there's, uh, there's kangaroos running down the street, uh, I'm going to talk in a very Australian accent and I've got a, a local paper here, so just to prove that's where I am and I'm not sitting in, uh, in your second bedroom. No, you're not, actually. We do have a guest bedroom for that, but uh, I'm in Texas, and I'll try to get a little slur, southern draw going on there just to make it real, so uh, so we're good. All right, listen, we have a shared goal of showing the colorist community how to do a remote grading session in Resolve and why this is important to you. We thought this would be a fairly easy thing to do, but it turns out there's some hidden gotchas, and you have to pay attention to those, and we're going to go through those step by step. Warren, what, what, uh, what do you want to say to Yeah, it's just started? interesting. It's something that I've had quite a few inquiries about the possibilities of me remote grading, and obviously maybe me letting someone else take some of the workload for myself. So it's uh, something that's definitely in vogue at the moment. Uh, I think it's really good because it enables people in remote locations who maybe cannot get to a colorist to be able to have their material graded. Uh, and what it involves, basically what it involves, it involves uh, someone like myself here and I will prep a session in Resolve using the $4,000 version of Resolve. That is important. I prep got to have a license, you've got to have the dongle. So I've conformed and prepped everything as I would normally do. I then export the project and I come here and I go to File, Export Project and I would send that. Now I've sent that to Tom in Texas. The media I've got here is quite small. That's because he's downloaded that. And that's an important consideration as well because you do have to have the media on both ends when you're doing remote grading. It's not sending the media over the internet, it's just sending the commands. So once Tom gets the project, then we're both looking at exactly the same thing on our monitors. Do we have to have exactly the same size or uh, can they be different in size or they just the same file names? What, what are the specifics on that? So the same uh, display resolution that we're looking at on our GUIs here for it to work. File size, the file size could be different. I could have sent a UNH264 proxy. I could have had ProRes422HQ and you could be using with proxies. But the project, the amount of clips and the actual length has to be the same. That's very important. Uh, uh, then what happens, obviously, we're relying on us looking at similar things. Uh, I've got a Flanders in here. I know you, you've got Flanders as well there, haven't you, Tom? Yes, I have a Flanders here, and uh, my room is 18% grey, just yeah. to make sure there's no yep. bias from the That's lights. That's right. So our rooms ideally would be colour grading environment rooms. Not always the case. Uh, but certainly if you're setting up I, what I would call is the client room, which could be something just like this. I use here, I've got a Sony OLED that's been, uh, but it's been calibrated up uh, using a Klein and SpectraCal, and that looks very similar to the Flanders. Uh, my clients just sit on the sofa if ever they come and do a job with me here. So if I was doing a remote, I'd probably do the same thing. I'd sit back on the sofa watch maybe what you've done or what another colorist has done. Um, so there's two ways of, of doing that. So that's a good option of having two things the same. So once our rooms are very similar, we've got the same projects, we've got the same media on both ends, uh, we're then ready to go. Once the client has prepped the project, they've sent it to the colorist, which in this case is you, uh, we need to make sure that you're running the same Resolve software version. This is important. It has to be the same version. So if you're running uh, 10.1.4, that has to be the same. Uh, obviously, you've got to have the same uh, duration, the same number of clips. Basically, everything has to be mirrored for, for this to work. And then we do our connectivity and we need a, an internet connection that connects using the IP address so then 
Tom will dial in from Texas and drive my machine here in Brisbane and I should just be able to sit back and watch. Uh, well, having prepped the project, you as the colorist in this project, you obviously needed to do a few things your end to get this working for us to enable our two computers to talk together. What did you do there? Right, thank you, Warren. To get two computers to talk over the internet, with you being the colorist in one and the client, or Warren in this case, you're going to need a couple of pieces of information. The first one is your public internet IP address. It might look something like this. Here's how you find your public internet address. Go to a browser and type in myipaddress.com. Write that down. You're going to need to identify on your local area network your IP address, which is different for security reasons. And it might look like this or this. Then you'll need to set up your internet router on your network to allow the connection with the client. Again, this is with Warren in this case, from his computer to your computer and back and forth. Once you've done this, you send him your public internet address and he puts this in hitting Command G and we'll get to this in a minute. One way of establishing remote access to a machine on the internet is to go to the firewall area to the DMZ settings. And in this case, for my computer, I needed to put down my WAN IP, that's my internet IP address, which it knew, and then I need to put in my IP address for my computer currently on the computer on my side. You can see how I put that in there. Let me just say as an aside, establishing a DMC setting on your router makes your computer extremely visible on the internet. You're not hiding behind anything at that point, so it is a security risk for you to do that. You need to keep that in mind. I've done it. I've done it successfully. I've had it up for hours like that, days at a time, but I've always taken it off. So you want to keep that in mind. The better way to do it is using a router like an Apple Airport router in between your internet and your local area network. Now, if you're on a Mac network and you're using Mac router, airport, what you can do is go to edit and then go to network. And this is assuming your router mode is in DHCP NAT mode. And you go to network operations, you click on enable default host, and you put in your IP address for that computer on your network there. There's one more issue you're going to need to deal with, and that has to do with the firewall on your computer. For right now, we're going to stay with the Mac. I know we also have to deal with issues on the PC and on Linux machines, and hopefully in another video, we can put something together which addresses each one of those with input from the user community. So for right now, we're going to stay with the Mac and its networking setup issues. And we're going to go again into system preferences and go to security and privacy. And we're going to turn on the firewall. And then we're going to go to firewall options. And you're going to add DaVinci Resolve as one of your applications. All right. And you're going to hit OK. That's probably something you're going to need to do in order to get the communication all the way through. Maybe not in other cases, but it was in my case. And remember that in a larger organization, you'll probably have a network person that can take care of all these things. So I hope it's not been too much detail. But these are the issues you have to address most likely to get secure communication going between the application, in particular on the colorist side. All right. So there you have it. You've got your internet IP address to the public, and you've sent that to the client. You have your IP address, and you've established a connection from the internet into your computer. And now, back to you, Warren. So what I need to do on my end, remember, I'm the client. Tom is the colorist. Uh, command G, and that brings up a dialog box here. I'm just going to delete that out. And it is called Remote Grading Client. And in here is where I need to set Tom's IP address. So I've written this down. And Tom will have obviously just gone through and explained how we get that. Uh, and now I'm adding this in to this dialog box. 
one three four so I've got seventy dot one one three dot one nine seven dot one three four uh, and then I hit connect and it brings up and yep now we have it on my side so I'm gonna hit accept That's, and I'm gonna remove this I'm just gonna push this yeah, over to the I'll side. I'll do the same with mine so I can see what you're doing I normally would put it down the bottom there so it's not too in the way and yep, same here and I'm gonna just pop over here to yeah, the beginning can you that's uh, moved you're now looking one? at the couple yep. by the net all right I'll just sort of slide through here each one and that way you can tell me and yeah got that's them all great there, right okay well um we'll do a couple things here just yeah. for fun to see, yeah. see what's going on uh we'll just uh we'll start yep. with the lady uh, maybe we'll add a note yep. here we'll go over here and let's do kind of the classic it um, it's really interesting it's, it's yes. i can see it changing my panel as well as you're moving things there's this like flashing oh, no slightly on the panel <laughs> So things are actually changing yeah, here. that's really cool. All right, so we'll just sort of um, push this woman into yeah, way that's it. a little bit of a yondus look here. Yeah, that's good. Right, that's working. That's pretty that clear either. there, yeah. So we've got the window up. All right, and then I just did uh, like the reverse here, so we'll bring that down. And uh, there we go. And just grins and giggles, I have a power grade I set up for the... Uh, Oh, the uh, overall yeah. shot there. Oh, I like that, Tom. You've been doing a yep. bit of pre-work before I came online. That's that's extra value. Uh, I, well, yeah. I want to make sure I make uh, a good impression. Uh, I'll get you back. I'll hire you again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that sounds good. I'm really quite amazed how quickly that comes across. You know, one of the things worth mentioning is that we're not actually sending video no. back and forth there's a great confusion yeah. about that we're just basically sending bits of control yes. information yes it's basically um if you move the mouse around tom quite a lot we'll see you're obviously driving the mouse around and i'm obviously not doing anything uh so if you just move your right. mouse around now to different places you can see that as the gui changes things are happening and uh it's uh, it's a little bit freaky sometimes, especially when these panels start moving around and changing. So, what are the drawbacks, <laughs> Tom? Is there is there anything you can't go and do for me here now? I'm my client. Imagine I'm sitting here from uh, you know Gold Coast Tourism, looking at this ad here. You're grading. If I asked you to go and change a cut or put a VFX shot, can you do that? No, can't do that. Right. Right, I think, um, let's see, I don't know, if you actually go to edit, do you lose the... I uh, think it will come up and say, you know, you can't exit out of there. So this is true, you have to have a locked cut. I know we're always trying to achieve a locked cut here, but it's very important remote, because once we start, we cannot leave the colour screen. So we can't go in and pull gallery stills and things like that, that doesn't work. So we are locked into uh, what we start working with. Uh, there's a couple of other restrictions in terms of using LUTs and power grades, uh, preset looks. Uh, if Tom applies those, I won't see those here as well. So again, that's another little drawback that we can't do. Um, let's go on to some of the positives. Obviously, I think it's really good for someone like myself, someone like Tom, Freelancers being able to open up ourselves to uh, to uh, more markets is uh, really great. Uh, different parts of the country, post houses who have two locations. Maybe they got a place in uh, LA. They got a place in India. They can talk together. Colorists don't need to travel. Directors who have gone to another location or on their other job they can get into anywhere that has the resolve set up and good viewing environments and just check in for a couple of hours on the progress of their feature or their commercial. Um, the other thing I quite like, like if, uh, if I had a project and I send it to Tom, uh, he's grading away while I'm, I'm asleep, so we're both billing, in effect is good, and uh, my machine is utilised when I wouldn't normally be utilising it anyway. So uh, that's good. Um, 
The other thing to remember, I mean, we set and I could give Tom instructions and I could say, uh, Tom, you can do a uh, certain this or I want it graded this way or we need a power window or something like that. Uh, I don't have to tell him that. I could just give him a brief and go away and do other things, go shopping or something, go to the beach and then come back and then watch it. So I don't, we don't have to be chained together and talking on Skype the whole time. It just depends. Sometimes clients want to be there, like in a real session. Other times they will say to me, well, you know exactly what I want. This is, you know, episode five of a 10 part season. Uh, I would just get on with working with it. But the advantage for me is, and the advantage for Tom in this case, if Tom grades this ad for me, when we finish, he saves. That saves to my machine. It means Tom doesn't need to render. He doesn't want to render because he doesn't want my files. And then how is he going to get them back to Australia? I render on my end and I finish and do the supers or add the sound. So that's a good advantage, isn't it, Tom? Yeah, that's a big one. As a matter of fact, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> that's a very good point. Yeah, and for the colorist, we don't necessarily have to worry about the conforming and the things like that. Uh, and we don't have to worry about the rendering because that can be done on the client machine. Uh, obviously, you've got to stress it is important that that's done properly because we can't change it. Uh, but just for speeding up workflows and maybe if you did get behind on a deadline and you had an extra show you needed to get out and you could pass it off to someone else to help out. Now, I've done quite a lot of this before, but not actually with people watching live at the same time. And I think we're only going to get more of this, really. The world's becoming a smaller place and being able to access you know, someone's talents from another country is, uh, is quite an interesting concept. Yeah, there's quite a lot of time constraints put on these uh, episodic show things. And it would seem like if you th thought you were going to have to be doing some traveling to have a kind of buddy system with another colorist who's got your looks yeah. and they know how the show needs to be uh, look, basically, you know, from scene to scene, then you could pass some of that stuff over, not just out of an emergency, but out of a planned process. Yeah, to oh, totally, totally. Uh, there's another th slight possible problem that, obviously we've got a small timeline here for the ease of moving it and demoing it, but if our machines were different specs, maybe your machine will run faster than mine so they get out of sync slightly. Uh, yeah, they will always, stop together so when you hit I say stop Tom I need you to fix that shot you will hit stop they will go to sync but it will sync where your machine is which then obviously may not be the shot that I want you to look at so you know if you go to the first shot Tom there now and, and, you, and you hit play these are probably yeah, these would probably be pretty similar because they're quite small files. This is just, uh, it's just low res, it's just pro res. So, but obviously on a longer job, if we're talking features, we could get slightly out of sync. Again, it will always go back to the right place when you hit stop. So if we get near the end, I say to you, I'll tell you to stop. Okay, Tom, if you stop there. There we go, so we were pretty good. So they will both sync on stop and that's pretty close. So that's another thing, uh, you know, most of the kit that we're using these days are quite similar in spec. So that may or may not be an issue depending on where you are. Uh, I do see and I have seen already some of the bigger post shops are sort of setting up these uh, smaller maybe boutique places that are remote stations where they just have a, a nice monitor, have your Flanders or your Dolby or whatever in there, good for your environment, great coffee, good sofa, and they have a resolve that they prep it with, but then the clients are just coming in and watching. Oh, that's really, you, you're actually seeing this in some series? Yeah, I'm starting to see this. There's quite a lot of big shops are doing a bit more remote grading than we sort of know because they have the talent, they've got the colorists and they just want to make use of them. And, uh, you know, the whole off hours and different time zones in the world is a really interesting concept for that. But I think we're starting to see these little 
boutique where they're just locking grades. Clients can come in. Uh, they don't necessarily need all the panels and things because if you're just conforming, uh, you don't need the bigger panels. You just obviously need your software, the same, and uh, a good monitor because, uh, you know, if they are making critical decisions, if I was sitting here uh, critiquing you about the colour of your magenta sky there, then really we've got to be looking at the same and same viewing environment as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and basically, it's great for Rec 709 type workflow because most of us can all get our monitors into that, into that space. So let's sum up here. Thank you very much, Warren, for all of your information and most of all your insights. First off, you need a full version of Resolve. That's the one that has a dongle with it, not Resolve Lite. The same software version needs to be on both ends. So if you're on Resolve 11.1, you need to be on Resolve 11.1 on both ends. Project must have the same number of clips and the same duration. Must have media on both machines. So you can download the media or you can mail it on a hard drive if it's a bigger project. But either way, you're going to need media on both sides. Codecs don't have to match. So you could have ProRes 444 on one end and ProRes LT on the other. The internet connection needs to be set up between both machines, as I talked about earlier. The colorist doesn't have to render. The client can handle the finishing on their end. That's pretty cool. And remember, most importantly, you need time to test and confirm your connections between both machines. You'll want to set aside a completely different day for that, just to be sure. That way you know everything's working the way it needs to work. You'll want to do that before you start your official session time. Finally, a very special thank you for Media Village in Singapore for the video recording on Warren's side of the demo. Well done.